people. They care for each other, they watch out for each other, and they keep an eye on each other, and then if you do achieve, everybody's happy for you. And if you're having a problem, they try to help you too. Prime example of that is a good hunting buddy of mine in Chivak had a, a fire and one of his kids died in the fire and his wife and three others were burned in fire pretty bad and I mentioned it at a meeting and we sent him $500. In 1988 we turned back into the community about $118,000 and last year was about $138,000. And this is money that we put back into uh, scholarship funds, into uh, kids that are, that are in need of going to uh, higher education, to basketball teams, sponsoring softball teams, people that have problems uh, going to their father's funeral, uh, veterans that, have, uh, that are sick, and the veterans' widows. It's a very enclosed kinship, you know? Uh, it's a very tight group here, and we love it. We just... We love being out here. Up the river a piece is the even tinier, poorer village of Queethluk, where refuse makes it no further than out the front door, and wooden walkways form the only rite of passage through a place still recovering from its annual flood. With so much water, you'd hardly think it needs a fire department, but more than 20 town folk volunteer here. This part of Alaska has the highest unemployment and welfare rates in the state. Eskimo natives make about $5,000 a year fishing. Some of the catch hangs out to dry for another night's dinner. But this is a proud town full of veterans happy to have served their country and return to the only place they'll ever call home. John Alexi still remembers how his Vietnam tour got cut short. The, all the stoves were warm and I opened the gas valve and exploded uh, on, 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 on my body. In, in, uh, on the face. They asked me if I wanted to go back uh, to to where where I was, and I didn't uh, I didn't go back. I just went back back here to the mm -hmm. back here to Alaska to finish my uh, two years assignment. Mm -hmm. so I, I think the reason why I liked the bud is uh, uh, I was born here. <laughs> And it's just home. Yeah, it's just home. <laughs> Hulk, my home. Hulk. Alfred Alexi is an army vet who defended his own soil back in World War II when Alaska was a U.S. territory and part of the overseas theater. Six hours sleep and 12 hours work. And a uh, ship on the ship, big ship. Yeah. Yeah. Did you like that? That was a lot of work. I, I like work that time. <laughs> Queethlick veterans don't have a VFW post to congregate in. They use the National Guard Armory. It provides the same comfortable connection to a military past. But it seems here or anywhere else in Alaska, if veterans don't spend leisure time with the Guard, they work for it. In fact, of the 4,600 member combined Army and Air Guard, roughly two-thirds are veterans. They do a lot more than weekend training exercises. In a state whose westernmost point is but two and a half miles from this country's greatest historical enemy, the Soviet Union, a unique group of so-called Eskimo scouts does routine surveillance and intelligence gathering. The Guard also helps in natural disasters. It played an enormous role in rescuing several walrus hunters from the Bering yeah. Sea a couple years ago. And later, a story that captured world attention, freeing three California gray whales trapped in ice above the Arctic Circle. Martin Prince has been in the Guard since 1965. And I just said, you know, I don't, I don't want nothing to do with the Army after two years in it. I said, I joined the Guards. And I've been here ever since. And what they taught me in the military, I just carried it over to the guards. And it was real easy transition. Yeah. In order to get this job, I had to graduate from the regular Army course. And they, they've given me eight different airplanes to work on throughout my career. And uh, I worked with these veteran pilots. You know, they taught me a lot. Vietnam veteran Roger Brown was our trusty pilot for most of our trip. He's career military, first saw Alaska in the Coast Guard, liked it, stayed, and joined the National Guard about a decade ago. It was a flying job. 
and uh, it was a country that I was used to, familiar with, and uh, the money was good. It's a big state, a lot of variety, a lot of different types of flying, uh, demanding flying. Enjoy it. It was also an opportunity to recoup a military retirement. Probably no one understands the contribution of Alaska's National Guard better than Don Shantz. This World War II vet helped form it in 1949, serving in it himself for 21 years. But I needed discipline as a young um, person who really wasn't all that mature. And I'm glad to say that the military did help mature me and taught me um, education and caused me to become a better person. So I'm totally committed to the military way of life. And I've always felt that I, um, I do well with the underdog. And it was always a great enjoyment to uh, work with what somebody else couldn't handle or didn't want to handle. I enjoyed sticking my head into it. The um, system itself has been very, very good for the Eskimo people. Uh, they had basic adult education that it's brought and the exposure. But the very reason veterans come up here to Alaska to get away from it all is also what poses the greatest challenge to service providers, and that is how to get speedy, cost-effective quality care to a limited population scattered all over a very large state. Alaska and Hawaii are the only two states without a VA hospital. It's because most veterans would find it too hard to get to one. Instead, they can go to their local doctor and get reimbursed, and they like it that way. You call and make an appointment, and you're able to keep an appointment. Um, my dealings with the VA in the VA establishment has always been they'd schedule 50 of us at 8 o'clock in the morning to show up on the orthopedic ward and the doctor didn't get through surgery until 11.30 in the morning. Well, being a Marine, I'm a little slow on the uptake. It took me about a couple months to figure that out, and I started showing up then at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I was able to get in and get out. In addition, the VA has one outpatient clinic in Anchorage, but it's so crowded there are plans to expand it. The urgency was driven home to Veterans Affairs Secretary Ed Derwinski when he met with a group of veterans on a recent whirlwind trip to Alaska. Do you uh, anticipate that there will be any changes in the present facilities we have until the new ones are available or are we still going to have to contend with the jammed up space there at the clinic and two doctors and sometimes a two hour wait for medication out of the pharmacy. There you go, meet the secretary. A salmon bake gave Derwinski another chance to hear veterans concerns. Medical care surfaced again. Some relief should come from expanding sharing agreements with Defense Department facilities like Elmendorf Air Force Hospital. In fact, discussing that plan with hospital officials was also on the secretary's agenda. Elmendorf now has a dozen beds for veterans. A new hospital would add 18 more. Derwinski then set about checking up on his clients. Taking very good care of seniors, very good care of seniors. I don't have any problem, I can real good care of But the news wasn't all good. The gentleman has a problem with his disability, Brady. I want somebody in here to check it, and I want to, I want to know in a week just how he stands, because I've heard too much of that up here. The order sent the VA regional director scurrying to the phone. Gene Nelson is one of the state's three benefits counselors, and he can tell you about delays, too. And there's time consuming. It goes on it involved at every stage, which uh, is frustrating because we have the individual coming back to us on a weekly basis saying, what's going on with my claim? And we say, well, it's still being worked on. But evidently, we've got a uh, bureaucratic logistical logjam up here and we have to address it and uh, uh, perhaps uh, again maybe the remoteness uh, is such that some of our people here uh, aren't adequately addressing the problem that we'll, we'll have to cure that. There's no excuse whatsoever for a delay. After all we're in the computer world we've got to be better computerized but Mary as you know the big problem is the VA is a wonderful lovable institution but it's also a bureaucracy and uh, bureaucrats don't like to change and bureaucrats work at just one pace. Uh, that's not acceptable to us because we're serving a veteran. We're a service entity. We're not a typical 
government bureaucracy. We have a special, I think, responsibility to serve that veteran. So we've got to get our people hustling. And they may find they have to hustle even more, since the VA here is making an effort to get even more veterans into the system, especially those in the bush. The, the way in which we're trying to do our outreach at the present time is through a networking system, setting up a networking system where we can get the points of contact out into the various areas of the state, through the tribal leaders, through the National Guard um, uh, um, points of contact, through the service organization who have the, their various posts and chapters out in the field. Uh, thus far, we've done about three mailings, uh, considerable mailings, and uh, we've sent out thousands of, uh, of letters of information on both benefits and medical services. And uh, we've gotten a good response. Now, there are a lot of veterans in the bush, like our VFW friends in Bethel, who say they don't care about VA benefits, don't need them or want them, and figure it's a price they pay for living out here. Even so, Derwinski doesn't want them forgotten. Sure, they want to get away, but then they also want to have be able to fall back on the need. And when they do have a need, whether it be uh, the financial side for benefits or whether it be a medical uh, need, uh, we want to be there for them. The VA tries to be there especially for Vietnam vets. This resource center in Anchorage, there are four statewide, was one of the first in the nation. Counselors see about 500 clients a month and wish it were more. There's no doubt about it that we're short-staffed here uh, in all, well, uh, in two of the vet centers in Alaska, uh, Kenai and Wasilla. Uh, I've heard that our budget has been frozen for about four years in a row now. We just simply don't have the money to staff these positions. And as a result, uh, I think vets uh, are, are hurt by it. But there are some wonderful success stories, like Kenny Jones. He was counseled at the Vet Center for a post-traumatic stress disorder, returned to counsel others, wrote a book on the subject, and now has his life and career back together. Where would he be without the program? Honestly, I'd be dead. You know, we've had more than 62,000 suicides among Vietnam combat survivors, and I'd, I'm, I'd be one of them. What you've got there are people who speak the specific language of combat trauma, and every kind of trauma has its own language, its own symbols, its own metaphors, and what's essential is that, that people speak that lingo. The PTSD counseling program has been so effective it's spread to a very unique location, Elmendorf. The place employs a lot of Vietnam vets, and one of them had problems getting along. It prompted base and veterans officials to initiate a program to train supervisors to detect the symptoms of the disorder. Veterans, for the most part, having been around the military uh, and have been exposed to the military way of doing things, are very, very good employees. And uh, so that's the benefit of it. They are good employees. They are worth spending some time uh, with and on to, to walk through and wade through any particular handicap that they may have. The Resource Center also houses the State Labor Department's CARS program, or Centralized Applicant Referral Service. It's a networking system that plugs veterans into all sorts of federal jobs that pay well and provide security. Alaska is one of only two states that have the service, and the only one that's computerized. It's what the employers want. They can come in and they can request and they get one day or two day service and they don't have to go through the long process of administration and details of recruiting. It's good for the vet because he's now competitive. Uh, he has a job history from the time that he left high school or earlier. Many of them have worked in their parents' stores and farms and stuff and all that's good. So they have a total work history that they can walk out anywhere and, and use. Bryson Reardon is a car's success story. He's a Vietnam vet who drank too much, worked too much, burned out and gave up. Well, I've gone from uh, the bottom bottom of the slag heap or bottom of the manure pile all the way up to the top of the slag heap. I uh, worked through the CARS program and uh, gone from uh, just submitting my application around town or submitting it through the CARS program, being interviewed various jobs all over the state and uh, I worked as a cashier for a year at Port Richardson and uh, all of a sudden sprung into from a wage WG or GS position to a wage grade position working at the power plant. 
Ron Wirtz is in charge of veterans employment in Alaska. He started the CARS program up here and got something else going that few states have an annual meeting of all its veterans employment reps and outreach specialists to talk about problems and solutions. Overall, he says, veterans have it pretty good. I think there's a spirit of cooperation between veterans uh, who are employers and veterans who are seeking employment. And certainly the, there is a very strong preference for veterans in state and federal employment. Wirtz was also instrumental in getting Alaska's only veterans memorial constructed. It sits impressively in Denali National Park, with North America's highest peak, Mount McKinley, as a backdrop. We caught up with Secretary Derwinski once again as he lay a wreath there, then followed his chopper to the next site, Alaska's National Veterans Cemetery. It was originally created during World War II as a temporary burial ground for military casualties. Well, whatever impressions Derwinski developed, whatever improvements he plans to make, can only make a good place for veterans better. Alaska may not be for everyone. Life can be tough, some services less accessible, but it sure appeals to a lot of veterans. And not one we talked to would trade places with anyone in the lower 48 for anything in the world. From Alaska's Kenai Peninsula, I'm Mary Miller for Veterans Only.